Forward to the Hindi edition. Praying to Sri Guru, the Vaishnavas and Bhagavan and begging for their merciful blessings, I proceed to write the foreword to this present edition of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. In undertaking such an endeavor, the causeless mercy and auspicious blessings of the disciplic succession of spiritual masters in the line of Sri Rupa Goswami and Srila Prabhupada Saraswati Thakur are our sole aid and shelter. Sri Gaudiya Vedanta Samiti published its first edition of Srimad Bhagavad Gita on 6 September 1977 by the auspicious desire and blessings of my Sri Gurupada partner Nitalila Pravishta Om Vishnupada Astota Sata Sri Srimad Bhakti Prakyan Keshava Goswami Maharaja. That edition included the Gita Bhushana commentary of the brilliant sun among Vedanta Acharyas, Sri Srila Baladeva Vidya Bhushana Pada, as well as an elucidating translation entitled Vidvat Ranjana by Nitya Lila Bravishta Om Vishnupada Sri Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Following that, on 3rd October 1990, Sri Gaudiya Vedanta Samiti published an abridged pocket edition, consisting of only the Sanskrit verses and their Bengali translations. Several editions of Srimad Bhagavad Gita were published under the editorship of Jagat Guru Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnupada Astota Sada Sri Srimad Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Prabhupada. Some included Srila Baladeva Vidya Bhushana Pada's Gita Bhushana commentary, some Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's Sar Ardavarshini commentary, and some Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur's translations entitled Vidvat Ranjana and Rasika Ranjana. Later, various editions were published in Bengali by different mats, temples and missions in the line of Srila Prabhupada Saraswati Thakur. An Assamese edition was published in Tejapura, Assam, and some English editions were published in Calcutta and Tamil Nadu. A Hindi edition of Srimad Bhagavad Gita with the commentaries of Srila Chakravarti Thakur or Srila Baladeva Vidya Bhushanapada had not yet been made available. Consequently, the Hindi-speaking populace both in India and the whole world was bereft of such an edition of this jewel-like book. It is for this reason that my god-brother, Pujapad Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaja, the Vice President of Sri Gaudiya Vedanta Samiti and General Editor of its publications, is publishing this present edition of Srimad Bhagavad Gita with its Sanskrit verses, an Anvaya, word for word, verse translations, and the Sar Ardhavarshini commentary of the great preceptor, Sri Gaudiya Vaishnava Acharya, Sri Sri Lavishwanath Chakravati Thakur. He is also presenting a simple, comprehensive commentary known as Sar Ardhavarshini, Prakashika Riti. Sri Gaudiya Vedanta Samiti will remain eternally grateful and indebted to him for this. By deeply studying this book, the virtuous, intelligent readers will certainly receive supreme benefit and bliss. At the end of this preface to the Gita, Jagat Guru Om Vishnupada Srila Bhaktinoda Thakur comments. Unfortunately, most of the commentaries and Bengali translations of Srimad Bhagavad Gita published to date are written by the advocates of the doctrine 
that's the living entity and the Supreme Lord are non-different in every respect. Abhida Brahmavad. Only a few publications contain commentaries and translations that are in line with pure devotion to Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The commentaries of Shankara Acharya and Anandagiri are full of absolute monism, Abheda Brahmavad, or the doctrine that the living entity is non-different from the absolute truth. The commentary of Srila Srila Swami, though not full of Brahmavad, consists of a scant of the Rudra Sampradaya's doctrine of purified non-dualism, Sampradayika Shud Advaita. Some statements in the commentary of Sri Madhusudan Saraswati Pada support Bhakti, but its final instruction and essence expound Abheda Brahmavad, or monistic liberation. The commentary of Sri Ramanuj Acharya is completely in accordance with Bhakti, but those who taste pure Bhakti Rasa cannot derive ever increasing bliss from it. In our country, no commentary was available that follows Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's philosophy of inconceivable oneness and difference. Ajintya Bed Abeda. Therefore, to facilitate the pure devotee's relish of Rasa and to benefit faithful people, I took great pains to procure the commentary of Sri Gauranga Mahaprabhu's devout followers. The most erudent Sri Vishwanath Chakavarti Mahashai, the crest jewel amongst devotees. I have now published the Gita with this commentary as well as with a Bengali verse translation named Rasika Ranjana. The commentary written by Srila Baladeva Vidyabhushana Prabhu which also follows the teachings of Sriman Mahabrabhu, consists mainly of philosophical conceptions. Srila Chakravarti Thakur's commentary, however, is full of both philosophical conceptions and the mellow of pure love, Priti Rasa. I have published the commentary of Srila Chakravarti Thakur because his conceptions are easy to comprehend and his Sanskrit language straightforward. The general reader will therefore be able to understand it easily. Jagat Guru Srila Saraswati Goswami Prabhupada comments, Even though there are countless expositions, commentaries and translations of this book in many languages, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur still composed his Sar Ardhavarshini commentary, which follows the Sri Gaudiya Vaishnava conceptions. He did this especially for the Rasika Gaudiya devotees. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is fourth in the Siblic succession from Srila Narutam Thakur and is the guardian and preceptor of the Gaudiya Vaishnava Dharma in its intermediate period. This verse about him is most famous. Vishvasya Natarupo So Bhakti Vartma Pradarshanat Bhakta Chakra Varti Tatvat Chakravarti Akyaya Bhavat. He is known by the name Vishwanath, the Lord of the Universe because he indicates the path of bhakti, and he is called Chakravarti, he around whom a circle or assembly turns, because he always remains in the assembly, chakra, of pure devotees. All Gaudiya Vaishnavas know something about Srila Chakravarti Thakur, in particular those who study the Srimad Bhagavatam, discuss the Gita and study, teach and deliberate upon the Gaudiya scriptures will surely, to some extent, be aware of his transcendental brilliance. 
few authors have appeared among the Gaudiya Vaishnava preceptors who have written Sanskrit words and commentaries as extensively as Srila Chakravarti Mahashai. In the year 1706, Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur was very old. He sent his student, Gaudiya Vedanta Acharya, the highly erudite Sripad Baladeva Vidyabhushana and his disciple Sri Krishnadeva to a philosophical assembly in Jaipur. Great misfortune had befallen the members of the Gaudiya Sampradaya there because they had forgotten their Sampradayaka identity and had disregarded Vaishnava Vedanta. To dissipate that misfortune, Sripad Baladeva Vidyabhushana had composed an independent treatise on the Brahma Sutra in accordance with the thoughts of the Sri Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. In this way, he rendered a most distinguished service to the Sampradaya, which greatly pleased Srila Chakravarti Thakur. This was the second of Srila Chakravarti Thakur's great accomplishments in preaching Vaishnava Dharma. It is also a shining example of an approved recification performed by a non-seminal Brahmana and Vaishnava Acharya. Srimad Bhagavad Gita consists of 18 chapters, which comprise chapters 25 to 42 of the Bhishma Parva of Mahabharata. Sri Krishna's friend Arjuna is the listener and Bhagavan Sri Krishna is the speaker. Before reading Srimad Bhagavad Gita, it is of utmost importance to know the mutual relationship between Arjuna and Bhagavan and to understand Arjuna's conception of Sri Krishna as the Supreme Lord. Srimad Bhagavad Gita is not a scripture born of imagination, so there is no need of any interpretation of it that is rooted in mundane speculation. Sri Arjuna, Sanjaya, Dhritarashtra, Janamejaya and the sages headed by Shaunaka never took the Gita to be a metaphor. To say that Sanjaya represents divine vision, that Dhritarashtra represents the blind mind and that both are situated in the one body is simply the result of a sprouting imagination. Conversely, it is natural for a mind that is controlled by the soul to have divine vision, for that mind is capable of controlling the senses. Generally, people understand Gita to refer to Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which was instructed by Sri Krishna to his friend Arjuna. Modern-day bookstores, however, contain titles such as Gita, Samanvaya and Gita, Grantavali, promoting them as great works that embody the very essence of scriptural knowledge. Why is there objection to accepting the excellence and antiquity of Srimad Bhagavad Gita which is spoken by Sri Bhagavan and which has been adorned with such superlative titles as Sarva Jnana Prayojika, that which employs all knowledge, Sarva Shastra Sarputa, the essence of all scriptures, and Tatvarta Manjari, the flower bud of imports on the absolute truth. In the name of showering individuality and liberality, impersonalists, monists, polytheists and those who endeavor to synthesize spirits and matter use terms such as samanvaya, harmonizing or synthesis, that shamelessly profess that everything to be equal. Such persons are forever busy 
demonstrating their liberal morality through concocted commentaries that endeavor to offer some speculative form of adjustment on Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam and other scriptures. At present, the word Samanvaya is misused and misinterpreted. True harmony can only be found in Bhagavan. Fabricated conceptions can never be equated with harmony. Samanvaya Bhashyas, commentaries that claim to be present a harmonious conclusion on the Gita, are now found in shops and bookstores, but it is neither concord, anvaya, nor synthesis, samanvaya, to say that the world is Parameshwara, the Supreme Lord, or that Parameshwara is the world. This infectious disease of the doctrine of harmony is evident in many of the so-called educated elite. It must be opposed and refused. Those who pride themselves on their Western education and avoid placing the faith in the scripture and investigating true knowledge through it. Rather, they resort to various types of mundane logic to satisfy their tendency of inquiry. Atheistic historians and researchers analyze scripture using the latest research methods in order to determine its time of composition. Because they fail to accept its factual substance, they are unable to reconcile aspects of the scriptures that contradict their conclusions. Srimad Bhagavad Gita is a part of Mahabharata, yet they say it was added at a later date. This kind of research does not spread the glories of the eternal distinguished culture of sages who have seen the truth, Arya Rishis. Rather, it only confirms the researcher's indifference and disdain towards them. It is not a quest of immortal nectar, but the spitting of poison. Modern educated people fill their speeches and writings with the word sectarian, so as to boost their liberality. They forget that the glory of Arya Dharma, which is eternal, is sectarianism in its most pure sense. The current of true conceptions that is received through the Guru Parampara is termed Sampradaya, or a disciplic lineage that completely and properly bestows the supreme truth. This current has been flowing since time immemorial in the theistic society of India. The Arya Rishis firmly established the system of Sampradaya on a solid scientific foundation. The attempt to destroy it began with a fierce attack by those who adhered to atheistic communism, which came from the West. The root cause of such calamity is an erroneous understanding of the word sectarian. Now, many fabricated, narrow-minded sects loudly voice their opposition to the bona fides and pradayas. Unable to pursue the absolute truth, they take shelter of opportunism, thinking the frantic dance of their minds to be liberality or public opinion. Consequently, they are forced to become impersonalists, worshipping Brahman. 
the featureless aspect of the absolute truth, which is devoid of all potency. The blood to prove that Sri Bhagavan, the supreme absolute truth, is featureless, is now termed non-sectarian or asampradaika. It is fashionable to write so-called spiritual or non-sectarian commentaries on the Gita and other scriptures. Regrettably, however, in today's society, non-sectarianism refers to willfulness, opportunism and lack of inhibition. One should understand that those who reject the realized truths of the Arya Rishis, those who know past, present and future, and the eternally perfect exalted personalities, and who assert that their doctrines are spoiled by sectarianism, are in fact attached to impersonalism and materialism. Such people label as non-sectarian the commentaries of political leaders, fruitive workers, empiric philosophers and mystics. To understand the actual conclusion of Srimad Bhagavad Gita and the philosophical deliberates upon them, one must take shelter of the instructions of the previous Acharyas and follow those instructions. One will then be able to perceive and realize the inner intention of the Gita. A subject becomes easy to understand if the author himself gives an explanation or commentary. Otherwise, one's own understanding of the subject will naturally be tainted by the four defects. Error, illusion, imperfect sense perception and deception. Consequently, one cannot possibly understand the intention of the Gita unless one takes shelter of the realized truth imparted by the sages who know past, present and future, and the previous Acharyas within the Sibylic succession who are devoid of such faults. There is no other way. I shall try to present some of the truth that my most worshipful spiritual master, Sri Srila Bhakti Brakyan Keshava Goswami Maharaja, spoke on the subject of the Gita. The purpose of Srimad Bhagavad Gita is not to promote diplomacy or the ethics of Akshatriya, but rather to teach complete surrender to the lotus feet of Sri Krishna, the utmost supreme absolute truth. Arjuna is the cause of the Gita's appearance, and he can never be bewildered. His bewilderment is an act solely to facilitate the appearance of the Gita, for he is the eternal associate and friend of Bhagavan Sri Krishna. Sri Vyasadeva says, Parto Vatsaha, Gita Mahatmaya 6. From this we can understand that the milk of the Gita was not only intended for Arjuna, who is here compared to a calf. Sri Krishna says, Mam ekam sharanam vraja. Take exclusive shelter of me. Gita 18.66 Here the word ekam indicates that the sole intention of the Gita is to help one surrender to Sri Krishna, the possessor of all potency. In the Gita 9.66 31, we see that Bhagavan makes his devotee, Arjuna, declare that his devotee never perishes. Kaunteya pratijanihi na me bhaktaha 
Pranashyati. The purport is that Bhagavan always protects the vows of his devotees in every way, while he slakens his own vows simply upon hearing his devotees' prayers of distress. Therefore, out of his Bhaktavatsalya, affection for his devotees, Bhagavan proclaims his devotees' victory. In the Gita 4.9 he says, My birth and activities are divine and full of inconceivable potency. The Vedas have emanated from Ishwara's breathing, but the words of Sri Gita have emanated from his lips. The Gita is therefore as transcendental as the Vedas. In this regard, there is no scope for argument. In the Gita 9.11, Bhagavan tells Arjuna, Foolish people who are bewildered by Maya, consider my transcendental form of eternality, knowledge and bliss to be ordinary, like a perishable human body, and thus they slight me. Something that is devoid of form and features is never worshipable. Moreover, absence of features does not constitute transcendence. The form of Bhagavan and the Vaishnavas are eternal, all cognizant and blissful. They cannot be perceived by the mundane senses and are completely pure and transcendental. They are nirguna tattva, completely free from the material modes of nature. Jagat Guru Srimad Bhaktivedanta Saraswati Prabhupada writes in the introduction to his commentary. Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which consists of 18 chapters, is celebrated as an Upanishad. There are countless expositions, commentaries and translations of this book in many languages. The commentaries of Srila Sridhar, Sri Ramanuja, Sri Madhva, Sri Vishwanath and Sri Baladeva are most prominent. Those who have taken shelter of the Gaudiya Vaishnavas most worshipful Sri Chaitanya Deva are very attached to the commentaries that are approved by his associates. Those who are born in a seminal line of Brahmanas follow the Smarta Dharma as propounded by Manu and others. The Gita, however, delineates the system of determining caste according to character, a system that opposes this doctrine. Bhagavan Sri Krishna says, Those whose intelligence is blundered by the desire to be freed from distress worship the demigods according to appropriate regulations, being subject to their own natures. Why should we take shelter of demigods and not of Adokshaya, Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is beyond the purview of the material senses? If one abandons the worship of the transcendental Cupid, Bhagavan, Sri Vishnu, and worships others instead, one's human intelligence is both lost and destroyed. Until one is free from all desires, one cannot worship Kamadeva, the transcendental, ever-fresh Cupid. In his introduction to his Rasigaranjana commentary on the Gita, Jagat Guru Srila Sachit Ananda Bhaktinod Thakur writes, The most compassionate Bhagavan Sri Krishna, whose words always hold true, 
spoke Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which is an investigation into the essential imports of all the Vedas, to his friend Arjuna to deliver the entire world. These instructions of the Gita are the only means to deliver the world. The Gita is therefore the crown jewel of all Upanishads. The Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra and Bhagavad Gita are all pure devotional scriptures, Shuddha Bhakti Shastras. Those who possess a transcendental nature will certainly take the renounced order upon hearing the Gita, just as Uddhava did. The deep import of the Gita is that a person's eligibility follows in the wake of his nature. Without the Brahma eligibility, the conditioned soul cannot possibly attain Bhagavan. Fruitive action, karma, knowledge, jnana and devotion, bhakti, have different natures, and thus their identities are also different. For this reason, after due deliberation, the Vedas have been divided into three divisions, Karmakanda, Jnanakanda and Bhakti Kanda. Once karma transforms into bhakti, once one surpasses the desire to attain religiosity, dharma, wealth, artha, sense gratification, karma, and liberation, moksha, and instead finds joy in the service of Bhagavan. Bhakti is therefore the final aim of the living entities, prescribed duty, and also its fruit. Bhakti is a very profound principle. It is the very life of jnana and karma, and it fulfills their purpose. That is why the discussion on bhakti has been placed in the middle six chapters. By this we see that supremely pure bhakti is the final goal of the Gita. The verse Sarva Dharman Paridyajya, found at the end of the Gita 18.66, establishes that surrender to Bhagavan is the most confidential instruction. To understand the actual philosophical conclusions and lessons of the Gita from its auspicious beginning until its final conclusion, we must first surrender to a spiritual master in the line of the foremost Gaudiya Vaishnava, Sri Rupa Goswami, because the pure words and teachings of transcendental and eternally perfect personalities are free from error, illusion and so on. In fact, they are our only welfare. The neem, mango, tamarind and bell, wood apple trees on the banks of the pure Bhagavati Ganga grow bitter, sweet and sour fruit even though they are nourished by the same water. Similarly, due to their natures, the living entities, who are enchanted by Maya, the deluding material energy, preach different conceptions after studying the same scripture. One may ask why Bhagavan instructs his dear friend Arjuna to practice karma, jnana, yoga and so forth, if they are not the best sadhana? The answer is that Sri Krishna also states in the Gita that without bhakti to Sri Bhagavan, all endeavors in karma, jnana and yoga are fruitless and meaningless. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has instructed that worship in Anugatya of the gopis of Raja, following in their footsteps, is the highest type of worship. 
Aishwarya, Shittila, Bremenai Mora Brita. Love that is enfeebled by Aishwarya Jnana does not satisfy me. Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Adilila 3.16 This is Krishna's hidden intention. In the verse Sarvadharman Bharityaja Mam Ekam Sharanam Vraja, Sri Krishna, the source of all divine incarnations, has revealed and proclaimed his sovereignty over the material energy and the demigods. And he has also proclaimed himself to be the supreme object of worship for all. He is the basis and shelter of the empiric philosopher's worship of Brahman, the Lord's featureless aspect. He is the non-dual truth, Advaya Jnana Tattva, and he is the one true object, Vastava Vastu, that is, he is one without a second. The first six chapters of the Gita discuss Karma Yoga, the path of spiritual advancement where the fruit of one's pious action is offered to the Lord. The last six discuss Jnana Yoga, the path of spiritual advancement through transcendental knowledge. And the middle six discuss Bhakti Yoga, the path of loving devotion to the Supreme Lord, Bhagavan. From this we understand that Bhakti Mahadevi is the supreme shelter of karma and jnana. Bhakti Mahadevi was once established as one who gives life to jnana, vairagya and so on, in a gathering in which Srimad Bhagavatam was discussed. At Maya Tirtha Haridwar, the best among the seven holy places. Without the mercy of Bhakti Devi, neither karma, jnana, yoga, nor any other process can give the desired result. This is specifically evidenced in the following verses Gita 18.55, Gita 8.22, Srimad Bhagavatam 11. Point fourteen point twenty one Matara Shruti Bhaktya Tusyati Kevalam Bhaktir Bhaktir Eva Inam Nayati Matara Shruti and Na Sadayati Mam Yogo Srimad Bhagavatam eleven point fourteen point twenty In the authoritative scriptures the performance of supremely pure exclusive devotion, known as Vishuddha, Ananya or Kevala Bhakti, is said to be the final instruction for the living entity. From this verse, Satatam Kirtanyanto Maam, Gita 9.14, we can understand the worship of Bhagavan is the performance of the nine kinds of devotion, headed by chanting the name, form, qualities and pastimes of Sri Krishna. Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita states, Aprakrita Vastu Nahe Prakrita Gojara Transcendental objects are beyond mundane knowledge and the material senses. Madhyalila 9.195 Pride and scholarship are defeated in such an attempt. Bhagavan's mercy can only be attained by surrender to him and by offering him one's very self. Many people who are intoxicated by their mundane scholarship and pride try to study and teach the meaning of the scriptures, but they only cheat themselves and others. Sri Krishna spoke the verse Tesham Satata Yuktanam, Gita 10.10, for this reason. 
The fundamental principle in regards to Sri Bhagavan, Bhagavad Tattva, is realized through Buddhi Yoga, pure intelligence directed towards the attainment of the Lord, which is bestowed by Bhagavan. Those who try to understand the import of scripture while faithfully taking shelter of Sri Hari, Guru and Vaishnavas very easily cross over the ocean of material existence and attain transcendental devotion to the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. Performance of such devotion is the qualification for Brahma, pure love of God. Thus, the words Sarva Guyatama, most confidential, determine the supreme subject matter of the Gita, which is Prema, the fifth goal of life and the final stage of Sadhana Bhajan. Through this comparative discussion of the Gita, Sri Bhagavan has established the supremacy of Bhakti Yoga. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who delivers the people in the age of Kali, along with his dear associates, has shown the path to search for the most worshipful absolute truth. They have also shown the pinnacle of Sadhana Bhajan. In this way, they have bestowed incalculable benefit upon us. This is their causeless, heartfelt compassion upon all living entities. Throughout the entire world, their conception is therefore supported by wise men and scholars alike. Sri Guru Vaishnava Das Anudas the servant of the servants of Sri Guru and the Vaishnavas, Tridandi Bhikshu, Sri Bhaktivedanta Vamana, Yasa Puja of Sri Sri Guru Pada Padma, 25th February 1997.